So I'm uh, going to be uh, uh, talking about WGS based subtyping in module five in the context of uh, bacterial analysis. Um, and uh, joining us later will be Jimmy Liu, who's uh, uh, an SFU grad student. He will be handling the um, the lab component. So a bit about me. My name is Ed Svoda. I'm with the Public Health Agency of Canada uh, in the Genomic Epidemiology Research Unit. And our focus is uh, research and methods development for um, ecology and epidemiology of bacterial foodborne pathogens. Um, in this module, um, this uh, you know that don't be uh, scared of the number of slides. There's a lot of slides, um, but I wanted to sort of take you through the historical aspect of molecular subtyping and their application to molecular epi um, to then uh, start talking about uh, WGS and subtyping from WGS. Um, some of the analytical stuff, and um, but I also wanted to talk a little bit about genomic surveillance uh, in a broader context. Um, you know, uh, some of our previous uh, speakers have spoken about data sharing and you know, metadata, uh, uh, um, and I wanted to sort of um, give you a bit of an overview in terms of uh, you know what what's some of the surveillance that's happened prior to COVID, uh, you know, where foodborne surveillance was really where a lot of the activity was happening. Um, so I wanted to give you a little bit of that context. Um, so again, you know, lots of slides. Um, a lot of it is for context. We may have to get through some in order to get through the, the slide deck. So I'll keep an eye on time. So uh, subtyping uh, in uh, epidemiology, as you know, um, infectious disease isn't distributed homogeneously in population. There is a, you know, there's a different uh, exposure to risk factors, and there, uh, accordingly, there's also differences in the distribution of uh, disease outcomes. And the term molecular epidemiology was coined to capture the fact that we were trying to use molecular approaches uh, to identify and characterize infectious disease agents um, so that we could try to in, you know, infer uh, transmission uh, and try to uh, prevent and control disease. Um, so the molecular epi paradigm is, has always been fairly simple um, because at the end of the day, um, if you have patients that are ill and we're able to recover uh, a pathogen from those patients, um, we are expecting that where there is epidemiological concordance between cases, there should accordingly also be uh, genetic concordance between the pathogen that has been isolated from these cases and vice versa. Um, and the, you know, and, and so really a lot of this started with the development of methods um, to assess genetic similarity between isolates. Of course, um, you know, this goes back 100 years to when people started using um, approaches um, such as, um, uh, you know, biological approaches, culturing, uh, moving on to things like serotyping and so forth. Um, so, the, you know, so those are old school methods, of, you know, at their core, we're about trying to identify, um, you know, the, the a possible genetic similarity between pathogens. Now, this evolved in the 90s and on into a bunch of methods that were derived from uh, molecular approaches such as PCR, uh, running things on gels, comparing gel patterns, and so forth. So DNA fingerprinting, as it was, you know, as it was called. And it also led to the emergence of this, uh, what uh, Mark Atman, who's a prominent salmonella uh, researcher, uh, into, into what are called yatoms. And um, yatoms are essentially yet another typing method. 
Uh, so in this, you know, this all of these methods sort of came out at a time when um, genomics was in its infancy. That you know there were obviously molecular tools, and we had learned to harness them to characterize and develop methods uh, for you know uh, as proxies for uh, being able to evaluate the genetic similarity between isolates. Um, but it also was a bit of a wild west. You know, people would develop these methods, release them into the wild, publish a paper, claim that it was the best thing in the world, and then a lot of the validation and testing would be left to other people reading the paper and saying, I wonder if this method is going to work for me. Um, so now in terms of the application of molecular methods uh, in, in the con uh, context of microbiological surveillance, some of this has already been covered, but I'll just reiterate where you're collecting samples from potential uh, sources of exposure at the same time you're recovering isolates uh, and performing genetic analysis, comparing the genetic data of what we think are matching isolates, and then examining the epidemiology of those isolates. Um, more sort of to the point, um, you know, certainly in foodborne, uh, the you know the the emphasis on is on outbreak detection. Um, and the only way to detect a possible outbreak is to find multiple cases, a case cluster, uh, where everybody is sharing the same, you know, the same uh, strain of the pathogen. Uh, at the same time, if you want to prevent and control, then you need to be looking out there in the one health context, uh, looking at foods, looking at, you know, animals and so on, water, uh, looking for potential matters so that you can then at least uh, having found potential matches, you can then inform the population uh, about, uh, you know, how, ways to avoid exposure. Um, but the problem has always been the, the limitations of, of the molecular subtyping methods. Um, the, you know, certainly prior to the, you know, prior to the advent of genomics. Uh, um, so, and with a lot of these methods, the problem is that, you know, that you get a lot of matches and it's impossible to determine how significant those matches are. Um, you know, if, if, if you tell me, hey, my, my name is John Smith, and I am like, hey, my name is John Smith too. That's not as significant as if, you know, I said, hey, my name is Ed Taboda. And you told me, my name is Ed Taboda too. Because I'm like, really? Taboda is not a very common name uh, where Smith is. So that sort of context is really important. Now, in terms of WGS-based subtyping, you know, so, okay, in the 90s and the, the aughts, a lot of these methods were being developed. You know, the, we had sequencing, but sequencing was cumbersome at the time. And then you have starting the emergence of high-throughput sequencing, um, next-generation uh, sequencing. Um, and that sort of set the table for uh, WGS-based uh, subtyping. Now, I distinctly recall uh, 10 years ago being at a conference in, in, in France. Uh, one, one of the really good sort of molecular epi type conferences. Uh, and where the discussion was really about the fact that, you know, on the one hand, we have gen you know, genome sequencing coming, but we still don't have a ton of data. Um, you know, in the meantime, you know, you have these databases of molecular subtyping data. Uh, you know, for example, uh, for PSE, there was PulseNet and so forth. And these databases would have data on thousands of isolates, uh, historical isolates, outbreak isolates, and so forth. So the whole idea at the time was, okay, well, we have WGS, which is awesome, but we also don't have a lot of it. Uh, we also have these subtyping databases, which have a lot of data in them, uh, but we know that the, you know, that those methods are not the greatest. So then the idea was, you know, can we bridge that, that bridge those together uh, through in silico typing? Because at the end of the day, a lot of these methods, uh, you know, whether they're phenotypic or molecular, uh, ultimately can be tied to changes in 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 the DNA, and so therefore you you have the opportunity to uh, search for targets upon which these various molecular typing methods were based, uh, searching the WGS data, 
uh, and inferring the, the type based on the findings of these in silico searches. Um, I think this is a self-serving example on some of server determination because we built a tool for doing this. Um, and you would, you know, and certainly at the time, um, you know, the sentiment was, you know, serotyping has been around for a hundred years and it is embedded in our surveillance apparatus. Um, you know, that it's, it can be quite informative. It, you know, it doesn't necessarily have a tone of resolution, but it can be very informative. And certainly we know a lot about it. You know, doctors know it, epidemiologists know it, researchers know it. So if I tell you that, you know, this infection is uh, salmonella enteritis, everybody has an idea of what we're dealing with. Uh, and certainly from a, you know, in silico typing perspective, you know, we know uh, the O antigens, the N, uh, the H antigens, um, and we know uh, specific sequence variants that lead to different uh, differences in, in, among the different serovirus. Uh, and, you know, if you put this all into, uh, you know, sort of a, you know, a, a decision tree type scenario, uh, the logic rules, you know, can be used to infer serovar in a vast number of cases. Maybe not some of the weirdos where we don't have a lot of whole genome sequence data, but certainly for the big ones that cause a lot of disease. Those can be predicted very easily. And certainly at the time, you know, we developed this uh, tool called Twister. Um, and so the plan was, okay, well, you know what? We'll do the serial predictions. This is a matter of course. Sequence, you know, and I close are being sequenced. We will perform the silico prediction, and it will be there because you know people still want to know theorem Um, and uh, you know, and soon enough we won't really need it because there'll be such a mass of data. You know, and at that same meeting I was mentioning in France. Uh, Public Health England sort of announced that beginning the next year, in 2014, they would start sequencing every single salmonella that came through their surveillance. And, I, I, you know, it was a fairly significant thing because they were essentially saying, we are, you know, we are, from now on, we're doing genomics, survey, you know, genomic-based surveillance of salmonella in the UK. Uh, and... I mean, certainly I was shocked and excited at the same time, but I was really shocked that they would announce that. And they uh, basically, I think, pushed everybody else into the same lot so that we all felt like, you know what? If the UK is doing it, we should be doing it too. Uh, here in Canada, it took us a little while to catch up, but I think as of 2017, we basically started doing the same thing. So the WGS based subtyping paradigm is, is no different. Uh, we're still trying to estimate genetic similarity, but we can use whole genome sequence data. And a lot of this is really ultimately based on comparative genomics principles, um, because there's all sorts of different levels of, uh, of genetic variation in a bacterial genome, and all of those can be brought to bear uh, in the development of methodologies uh, that we can use for, for uh, genomic surveillance. Um, so then, um, now I want to take a. Uh, I'm going to discuss this multi-locus sequence typing, and um, you know, if you'd asked me 15 years ago if I'd ever be talking about MLSD fondly, I would have called you crazy because at the time it was not, you know, I was not a big proponent of it, and I will tell you why. You know, as the the, the slide deck proceeds, so MLSD was developed by uh, Martin Maiden at Oxford. And the approach is fairly simple. You know, and this, remember, this is a time where you can't just sequence, you know, 300 isolates in a sequencing run. Um, so at the time, you know, the idea was uh, let's uh, analyze seven to nine uh, genes by PCR amplifying them and then sequence them, sequencing them the old fashioned way. Uh, we can then take that sequence data uh, and put it through an analytical approach where you know, you infer the alleles, and then the combination of alleles can be used as a sub as a subtype. And you know, where you have a centralized data. Actually, this was was a pretty cool thing too, because it you know it really was the first time that there was a, an open database of subtype information based on 
uh, sequence data, um, where you know people could could upload their sequences, uh, generate a subtype, and everybody would you know we would all know what they meant. Um, so in many respects, NLSP became sort of the gold standard for molecular typing and molecular epi, uh, because it supplanted you know comparing gel fragments versus you know the you know the sequence data, which is so well. I, I mean, I shouldn't oversell it in terms of uh, ambiguities. We know that they occur, but certainly in the context of MLST with you know curation and so on, you move from fragments and gels to sequence data, which is a lot more unambiguous. Uh, and a uh, lot of different schemes were developed for some of the heavy hitting uh, pathogens, and uh, and the methodology was has been used in hundreds, if not thousands, of different studies. Now, the weird thing about MLST is the fact that it's not a proper phylogenetic analysis. I mean, there's um, certainly not nothing that you uh, that would compare to. Uh, some of the stuff that Fiona has mentioned and uh, and, and some, some of the stuff that's going to be covered in some of the other modules. And let me explain why. So if I was, you know, going to uh, perform a phylogenetic analysis on one of the genes that was amplified in MLSD, I would take that sequence data and then I would, you know, make a, a multiple sequence alignment and then, you know, analyze it with evolutionary modeling and I generate a tree. And you could even extend that to the seven genes in MLSD. But in actual MLSD, you don't even care about, well, you don't do the evolutionary modeling and you sure as heck don't end up with, you know, 3,500 data points uh, worth of sequence data. You collapse each gene into a single allele. And it's the combination of the seven alleles that you use in your analysis which sounds a little bit crazy until you dig it a little deeper into why will you know one why one would take such a crazy approach um so yeah we're essentially comparing the seven low size the seven data points um anyway so because of that i'm gonna have to take a little bit of a detour into sequence evolution um so we're going to talk about recombination and mutation, which has already been alluded to. Um, so, you know, in phylogen when you're doing phylogenetic analysis, you're you're really relying on a sequence diversification through the acquisition of mutations, because that's inherently a vertical process. But when you have species that, you know, where recombination is a, is a significant feature of their evolution. You can have, you know, alleles parachuting and replacing other alleles. Um, so that stepwise acquisition of mutation uh, is completely, you know, gone because you can have a, you know, an allele replaced by a completely different allele, or even by, you know, foreign DNA from a different species or, you know, a closely related species, and all of that's gone to hell. So that causes significant problems uh, in terms of phylogenetic signal, and um, and it distorts phylogenetic relationship. And so one of the things about microbial populations is that they they you know you have a variety of different types of of, uh, of bacterial population structures. So, um, you know at, on the one extreme you have clonal populations that essentially are you know, acquire mutations and where evolution is nice stepwise acquisition of mutations, the old fashioned way. Uh, you have what are called weakly clonal uh, species where there's a, you know, there's some recombination happening and where primarily the, you know, muta the stepwise mutation happens within lineages. Uh, you have uh, epidemic uh, uh, population structures where uh, the vast majority of the population is not really participating in this stepwise, um, you know, evolutionary descent type of situation. There's a lot of recombination happening at low levels throughout the entirety of the population. 
And then lastly, you have this thing that thing mixing. Oh, I was having a tough time uh, saying it. Uh, uh, in Panixia, you have essentially this uh, a free for all of recombination, and um, you know, and it makes it really difficult to do proper uh, phylogenetic analysis. So all this to say that different populations will have different combinations of, you know, recombination versus mutation. Um, uh, a lot of uh, species have a bit of both. Um, and you know, and you you're kind of left having to figure out the the relative contribution of either process. Um, and you know, but all this to say that high recombination will have that distorting effect that we've been talking about. Um, I talked about epidemic population structures, and it, it, basically what happens is you have a lot of different uh, you know micro lineages. Uh, sort of in the background and they're exchanging recombinationally uh, amongst themselves. And, and this is very much sort of like a network-like situation. And then every once in a while, you'll have a clone that, you know, that expands, you know, that has gained some sort of foothold in the population. Maybe it's exploited a niche. And it is these sublineages that then will evolve more in a tree-like fashion uh, and that are more amenable to phylogenetic analysis, proper phylogenetic analysis. Um, so then, you know, for many, uh, now, uh, uh, for many pathogens, this type of population structure um, then makes it really difficult to figure out lineage to lineage phylogenetic relationships. Um, and so that really the only parts of the population structure where you can do proper phylogenetic analysis are these sort of tornadoes or, you know, cones or whatever. Um, so then, so in the context of typing, you know, it becomes more important to be able to identify these clones so that we can then do more proper analysis within them. And then the phylogenies between the different sublineages are a bit of a, you know, a, a bit of a uh, uh, something for another day or for more research purposes. So let's get back to MLFD. You know, we're joking about the fact that instead of using you know 3,100 data points for molecular evolution analysis, you're condensing everything into seven data points. Now, one of the reasons why this is advantageous is you know that the fact that by collapsing a particular gene into a single data point, uh, you are sort of bypassing the potential introduction of multiple mutations through recombination, as often happens in recombinogenic species. And and so for MLFD, you know, this epidemic structure is really the prototype. And there's a group uh, led by Ed File in uh, who's the bath now, I believe, um, who developed this algorithm called uh, BIRD that enabled the clustering of MLST data using this, uh, this epidemic type of approach. Um, the method one was then um, um, replaced by uh, an updated approach called the GLOE-BIRST, which is a globally optimized burst analysis. But basically, at the end of the day, you know, sort of burst and its progenitors are all based upon trying to identify central types here depicted in red, who are related to a cloud of additional subtypes that, you know, that are very similar, maybe have one, two, or three allelic differences, uh, and where you've done the, 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 uh, the mathematical analysis to figure out that the guy in the center is the one who uh, who takes the least number of allelic differences in order to capture the cloud. Uh, so there it becomes a center type, and it's what we call the the you know the the founder of the clonal complex. Uh, Javier, I see you uh, have a question, yeah. but I I don't know if I'm going to be able to hear it. Maybe you can type it. Okay. Or someone. Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. I don't know why that's happening. No worries. I can. I can ask it at the end of the presentation. 
I see Martin is also typing. Okay, so maybe I'll continue, and then once the question pops up, I'll, I'll come back to it. So this eBurst e approach of defining clonal complexes, that's what we call them, clonal complexes, where you have a center type uh, surrounded by all of, the, all of the single, double, and triple locus variants. Uh, that becomes a com clonal complex. And, um, you know, and if you perform this in a population, then it kind of looks like this, like a nice constellation with little, you know, my pockets of Convergent evolution, would it uh, cause problems for this type of analysis? Um, here's the thing. Uh, this doesn't pretend to be an, an, an evolutionary analysis in the least, quite frankly. Um, it is, uh, you know, we're trying to identify lineages. As I was saying before, it's all about the lineage of man and, it, and the relationship between lineages is an afterthought. Um, and, and it is because ultimately, you know, when you're dealing with these epidemic type population structures, um, the, you know, you're primarily, you primarily care about those lineages that are really, that have a public health consequence. So, um, you know, I, I'll, the only thing I will say is that if you were trying to do final, well, put yourself back 20 years ago. When you had limited data, you couldn't sequence your way out of this. And where tools for, you know, phylogenetic reconstruction that were aware of recombination, et cetera, didn't, you know, were in their infancy. This was the pragmatic solution. Was there another question? Okay, I'll, I'll see it come up on, on the chat there if... Uh, if anyone has any additional questions. So anyway, like it's hard for me to defend this because I always thought it was so, so crazy, but we're gonna, we're gonna get there. Okay. So eBurst, MLST, uh, what well, served its purpose at the time. Uh, I'll, I'll take you through the nomenclature of MLST because it is kind of part of its charm where, um, you know, you have allelic, uh, the alleles of uh, different genes have a number, and it's kind of like first come, first serve. The first allele that was discovered for a particular gene is given allele number one. Uh, the second one that comes into the database is called number two, and so on and so forth. Um, this total allelic profile for ST21, so the 2113215, that's the allelic profile for ST21. And, you know, if, and I need not repeat the alleles, everyone knows that SD21 means that. Um, I was talking about single locus variants. This is an example, you know, so SD, uh, you know, so SD50 differs from SD21 at one locus. The GLT at um, lo uh, locus, and it's the 12th uh, allele that was found. Uh, this is a double locus variant and so on and so forth. Okay, and I talked about clonal complexes. So the founder, which in this case is SP21, and you'll notice that all of the other guys in the table are similar, have a similar profile. They share anywhere from four to five to six, uh, four to five to six uh, of the same allele as the founder. Obviously not seven or else they would, would be SP21. But this also illustrates one of the first um, one of the first uh, efforts to develop a nomenclature, uh, and nomenclatures are really, really important because they represent a way of telling the world, this is what I've got, and everybody understands what that means. Uh, without me having to share the sequence data, I can tell you I have an SP21 isolate, and we already know what we're talking about. Um, and and it, it and you know people uh, describe this as a portable approach. MLST was the first portable approach to typing because it was sequence based. Everybody knows what it, what every thing, you know, what the different STs meant. Uh, and all, all that you need is to know the name. But I also told you that I wasn't a big fan of MLST. And so now I'm going to destroy MLST over the next several slides. The first one was, you know, that even 
you know, back in the day, we already knew that just because you said this is SP21 and that's also SP21, that they weren't necessarily very similar at the at the genome level. Um, here, uh, in this, uh, oh, okay, that's not well. Um, so here you see uh, a dendrogram um, with, uh, you know, with distance matrices attached to it, showing just the diversity of a whole pile of SP21 isolates that are supposedly identical. Um, at the same time, you, you have to know seven genes, you know, on a genome that may have thousands of genes is not a, 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 like a lot of uh, information to make such grandiose pronouncements about this being the same as that. Uh, and the other issue with MLSP was the fact that, you know, the data sets tended to be overrepresented with uh, some really heavy hitting SPs. Um, so it has very limited uh, usefulness in terms of epidemiolog epidemiological investigation. Um, so in many respects, good for sort of long-term tracking and surveillance, but you would never use this um, for an outbreak situation. So when whole genome sequencing started becoming uh, more routine, you know, with high throughput sequencing and so forth, um, you know, the folks who had developed MLSD in the first place started suggesting, hey, you know, why don't we just do uh, MLSD at the genome scale? Um, and, um, you know, so that we could harness WGS data, but we could still stick to some of the same principles that had made MLSP into the gold standard method. Uh, and at the same time, you know, you could sequence the whole genome, extract the MLSP data so that it would be backwards compatible. Uh, but at the same time, you know, you would be able to extract a lot more low sign, making it way more powerful. So scaling up MLSP then become, became sort of a thing that needed to be done. Um, and it should be super easy, right? Like we already know how to do MLSP. Now we have whole genomes where we just throw everything into an MLSP schema. And now I'm going to tell you why that's not advisable in the least. So the, one of the first problems is that the fact that not all genes are present in all strains when it comes to bacterial genome. We have this concept of core genes and accessory genes. Um, so the first paper that illustrated this was, uh, came out in 2005. It was an analysis of eight genomes of uh, strep galactiae. Uh, um, and they showed that, and it was kind of mind-blowing at the time, the fact that the genomes, they sh sure, they shared a lot of stuff, but they also sh were very different. Um, and so this gave rise to the, you know, to the pen genome concept, where you have core genes that are essentially shared by all members of the species. You have accessory genes that have varying levels uh, of uh, presence in the population. And the combination of the two is what we call the pen genome for a species. So there isn't a genome for E. coli, there is a pen genome for E. coli that comprises the core that's found in everybody, the accessory that is the collection of genes found among all of the E. coli that have ever been looked at. And that totality then becomes the pen genome. But when it comes to MLSP, the problem is that accessory genes, by definition, are not found in every single genome. And we have no a priori uh, knowledge as to whether or not a particular uh, genome should, uh, you know, should carry a particular gene. Uh, if it's accessory, we just don't know. It could be a coin flip. And that makes it problematic from an analytical point of view because um, we already discussed the fact that we're dealing with genome assemblies. We're not talking about complete circularized genomes. Uh, we've talked about reference guided assembly and de novo assembly. Uh, um, you know, in a lot of cases, we're dealing with de novo assembled genomes. And we end up with gaps, you know, with contigs and gaps. And, you know, the better the assembly, the fewer contigs you have and the fewer gaps you have. We always have, um, at the very least, you know, the, the however many contigs you have and minus one, that's the number of gaps. So if you have 50 contigs, you have 49 gaps to deal with. 
Um, and generally speaking, when you're dealing with, uh, you know, the potential collision between one of the locus, one of the loci that you're going to try to use and the fact that it is hitting one of those assembly gaps. Um, so, and if you can't define it, well, then you can't call it, which means uh, no data for that locus. Um, and again, you know, the problem being, we don't even know if this gene should be there in the first place, because maybe it's accessory. We didn't know anything about the strain and whether it should have that gene. So now we don't know if it, you know, if it doesn't have the gene because the, you know, it's not in its accessory genome, or we don't know if it's just missing from an incomplete assembly. So bad news. You know, especially because as data sets get larger, you end up having, you know, the near certainty that you're going to have low side that are going to have missing data. Uh, and that, you know, that there's sort of a baseline, you know, in a, in, a, in a data set, you have a baseline of genes that have incomplete assignments. Uh, but then there, and then there's going to be certain genes that are just problematic throughout. Um, so you can't escape missing data. So you're going to have to do quite a bit of quality control to make this work. Um, the other thing, it, you know, and this was alluded to by Fiona and uh, I think Will also brought it up, the concept of orthologous and paralogous genes. Um, and suffice to say that we're dealing with potential gene duplication and that we can't necessarily match one duplicate in one strain to the same duplicate in another strain. Uh, and that in order to be able to map that properly so that we're talking oranges to oranges and apples to apples, some fairly sophisticated analysis has to be performed. Uh, and, you know, you're lucky that that uh, that Fiona and her team have worked on this problem for a long time, but still, this is not something that you want to be dealing on the regular. Um, so yeah, these types of loci uh, that may be duplicated just have to go. We also have the issue that there are certain genes that show variability in sequence and or in length, um, or significant variation in sequence and or in length. So that as you start scaling up to you know data sets uh, comprising thousands of genomes, you're going to see all kinds of weird stuff. And some of this doesn't even have to do with biology. Some of this just could be the propagation of uh, you know of errors, assembly errors, and so forth. Um, so because of that, you know, genes that have a lot of length variability or that have significant sequence variability, uh, where it's, you know, not necessarily possible to always know uh, whether, you know, what you're seeing is real, um, the length variation or, or so forth, better to just sort of get those guys out. So this brings me to CGMLSD, or core genus multi-level sequence typing. So in core genome MLSP, basically, um, we're focusing on core genes because it's several, it solves several of the problems that I was talking about, um, especially in the context that, you know, in the olden MLSP days, people, you know, there, there are curators. I think I found a new allele. And then you send them an email and, and you say, can you look at this allele and tell me if it's real? And a person would get back to you and say, yeah, you know what? I think that that's a new allele. That's a new sequence type. Let's make it so. That's not going to happen in, you know, in a genomics environment. Uh, so it pays to get a lot of this sorted out ahead of time. And CGMLSD is one of the ways to do it. Um, because core genes are shared by all members of the, of the species. Uh, so you know they should be there. You know, you don't have to wonder uh, if the gene's not there, it's because the assembly is no good, or you know, or or that particular assembly didn't have a complete version of that gene. Um, at the same time, uh, core genes tend to display mostly SNP level variation. So that you know, in terms of homology searching, it means it makes it a lot easier to map things in terms of the start of the gene, the end of the gene, and knowing, uh, you know, that you've got the right thing. So it, you know, as I say here, it provides a robust foundation for C, for uh, genome-based typing. Now, in terms of designing a schema, 
I'm going to sort of talk about this particular software that was developed by some colleagues in Portugal uh, called Trubaca. Um, and the thing about it, you know, if you ever had to develop a schema, this is the tool that you would use. Now, hopefully, you know, you come into the job and, and someone's already developed the schema for you and then you just have to apply it. But if you have to start from scratch, this is the way to do it. Because Trubaca takes a lot of the concepts that I've been talking about, you know, loci that show extreme variability in, in, in length and or sequence, uh, loci that tend to end up with truncated calls, uh, paral uh, paralogous genes, and so forth, gets rid of them. It defines the core. Uh, and that, so it starts with the core, and then it gets rid of the problematic genes within the core, so that you're left with a really well-behaved schema comprising core genes only. And not only that, you know, it create it helps you create the the schema, but it also um, it allows you to evaluate the schema, you know, so that you can again figure out like, okay, you know, this is my core. How much of the core has to go? And, but it also does the allele calling. So yeah, very multi-purpose uh, uh, tool, love it. Uh, and as I say here, it helps to standardize the development of CGMLSD schema, uh, you know, by using some really well-defined principles. But there are still things that you need to do when you look at data. Um, now, if you use, uh, Chewbacca, a lot of these things are no longer, you know, are no longer something to worry about. But, you know, certainly before Chewbacca, when, you know, if you were trying to do this by hand, um, trying to define a core is actually more problematic than people think because of the fact that you're, you know, you have a data set, you're trying to define the core from that. Great. Why don't I just choose the genes that have complete data across all the genomes? You could tell yourself. And then I would tell you, well, how do you know that you don't have some crap genomes in your data set? Um, and that that is driving down the number of core genes that you are identifying. Uh, the, the, you know, I can tell you just from personal experience that a good, you know, 10 to 15% of the genomes in your data set are probably going to require resequencing. And, um, and if you don't take care of that up front, then, Finding the core becomes a bit problematic. Uh, you may find that, the, you know, hopefully someone knows or has a rough idea of what the core should be or the number of genes uh, in the core. If you don't know that, you're going to have to do some work. Uh, if you do sort of have a rough idea and your core is turning out too small, then you probably are dealing with uh, a certain proportion of genomes in your data set that are just not of high quality enough. Uh, you know, the, um, as I say here, the core uh, genome definition, um, you shouldn't be defining a core based on 10 genomes. Uh, I mean, you can, but then it's not a core definition for the species. It's a core definition for the 10 genomes that you're analyzing. Um, and you have to get rid of core quality genomes, as I said before. Don't start adding, you know, genomes from, you know, other species, you know, I work primarily in Campylobacter jejuni, and people developed uh, Campylobacter jejuni, Campylobacter coli hybrid um, uh, schema. That's not helpful. Um, and you, you also need to inspect patterns of missing data. You know, as I mentioned before, sometimes certain genes happen to be in regions that don't assemble particularly well. Get rid of them. So, you know, and this is another thing that I find I've, I have found very really annoying is, for example, the same Oxford team that had been the major proponents of, of MLSC and then CGMLSC and so forth, they defined their CGMLSC schema not at the near 100% level of what a core should be. They defined it at 95%, which just means you've got that 5% of genes that are not really core. But now you have to wonder when you're doing your analysis whether or not you know that five percent is going to cause you a hell of a lot of trouble. 
Uh, and and as I cannot, you know, emphasize this enough. You got to get rid of crappy genome. Okay, let's move into clustering. I am no clustering expert. Um, but, you know, but I, you know, but we're dealing with CGMLST data. You know, the, like the proper clustering that is going to be used by our uh, our, our folks that are uh, you know doing the phylogenetic modeling. That's a different thing. Um, but, and again, as I said before, for CGMLST, the thing really is trying to identify these lineages. Uh, and I talked about burst. Um, gen, you know, people are generally quite shocked about how rudimentary this analysis is because it just uses the Hamming, like uh, uncorrected Hamming distance, which is the proportion of differences between two profiles. And then the clustering. Um, um, I think Fiona didn't want to cover UPGMA because that's clustering for children. Uh, but let me tell you, a, a lot of people use UPGMA when clustering CGMLSD uh, uh, data. I won't take you through that though. You know, I, um, we tend to use slightly more sophisticated methods, but they're still rudimentary compared to the you know sort of like the phylogenetically aware methods. Um, I, I will talk about single linkage clustering uh, more because it generates results that tend to look like this other approach called um, minimum spanning tree. Um, you don't have to learn all of this. I certainly have a rudimentary knowledge of it, but all this to say that MSPs are all the rage among the cool kids who are clustering CGMLSD data. Um, the, so that one of the nice features about an MSD is that it tries to minimize the total, so it creates a tree and then by minimizing the total branch lengths, connecting all of the different, uh, uh, all of the different genomes. Uh, and yes, it is an acyclic graph where all of the nodes are connected. Um, but what I really want to talk about is this thing called grape tree. So if you recall, BURST was sort of the method that Ed Farrell, uh first developed to cluster MLST data. Uh, and that, you know, our colleagues uh, who actually, the same group that developed Trubaca, developed this Go eBurst algorithm, which is sort of a souped up version of eBurst that took into account the fact that, that BURST wasn't a complete mathematical solution. So um, Go eBurst was sort of like a globally optimized eBurst algorithm. And wouldn't you know that um, the, uh, Zhu Al, who included um, the Persnickety guy who was talking about Yadams, his lab. Uh, and also they, you know, they worked together with the Portuguese guys and they developed this uh, method called uh, NST. MST tree, uh, MS tree V2, uh, which was implemented in the software package called Grape Tree. And it has a couple of really interesting features. One is that it handles missing data better than conventional tree algorithms. The other thing is that they've enabled, um, well, one of the main issues that we have with uh, genome scale MLST is the fact that Again, you're dealing with assemblies. There's going to be a certain level of, of missing data if you don't want to get rid of every single genome in your data set. So you, you end up with a lot of sequence types that only differ from other sequence types by, by one or two uh, loci, and where the difference isn't really a difference because it's more the fact that there's missing data for one of the genomes. So you you know, you don't want to have to be dealing with that and MSTD2 takes care of that. At the same time, you know, it builds upon burst analysis and tweaks some of the math so that it can find, you know, the, 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 the founders of clonal complexes in a matter that, in a, in a way that is a, a bit more mathematically consistent. Uh, so this is my preferred approach. In terms of epidemiological interpretation, um, 
one of the things you have to deal with is, you know, you have a tree, the trees are nice, but they're not practical. And certainly not in the context of you having to go and talk to epidemiologists who are expecting spreadsheets. Um, so basically you have to take a tree and you have to decompose it into groups of, you know, highly related genomes. Uh, and generally this is done by applying a distance or a similarity threshold. So let's talk to this. I'm gonna to go to the side and we're gonna discuss this. Uh, this isn't a new thing. Um, you know, so Charles Darwin was talking about lumping and splitting. Uh, you know, where do you define, where do you define a particular species? Where does the next species begin? Uh, and this is no different. You know, you have a tree, where do you set a threshold that generates groupings that are useful? Um, and the reality is that there is no, you know, sort of major guidance on how to do this. A lot of this has to just be done empirically. Um, and generally speaking, a lot of this, um, you know, has uh, really been based on, you know, people who have access to outbreak data, they set the thresholds to maximize concordance with uh, outbreak data. Um, but still, you know, there there is a lot of different places where you could, you know, draw that line. And ultimately, I think, like, me, I'm more of a proponent where we should be, um, you know, we should be using a combination of population structure as well as ecology and epidemiology to help inform where to draw the line. Um, because ultimately we know that ecology and epidemiology influence population structure in many respects. Um, and so why not use that information to, you know, to do um, something that's informed by those things. So let's go back. So we have genomic clusters from WGS data from a practical perspective, then what do you need? Um, so if you have a tree, you can imagine just dissolving edges or branches that are beyond a particular length. And whatever you're left with as little clumps, that's what you would define as a group. Uh, and those clusters now that you've extracted from your tree, then you can subject to a variety of different analytical approaches. Um, you know, if you have metadata, for example, on, oh, you know, which of these genomes is associated with a particular type of antimicrobial resistance? You could then, knowing that you have this tree, you've decomposed it into all these different clusters, you can calculate cluster by cluster AMR rates, and you could identify the clusters that are really hot, have a lot of AMR versus the ones that are not, and so on and so forth. So when you take the tree and then you decompose it into clusters, then that enables you all this, you know, uh, to become a lot more, um, how can I put it, quantitative rather than qualitative. Um, yeah. yeah, so you're making analytical units that you can subject to further analysis. And then you can sort of to, you know, go back, you take the tree, and you can start mapping some of the things that you've calculated upon you know, the various clusters that you extracted in the previous step. Uh, and you can make a nice visualization like this one here that shows you, you know, that shows you, you know, regions of the tree that represent large clusters, uh, some that have, uh, you know, high proportions of human clinical cases within them, uh, clusters that have high rates of uh, fluoroquinolone resistance. Now, one thing is that ultimately you're going to have to, you know, people do this, you know, uh, pains me to say this, but people are going to have to manually inspect uh, the contextual data of an outbreak to ensure that it looks kosher. So in this particular outbreak, you know, you look at the date, month, and year of isolation, the source of the, you know, of the isolate, and then the location information, and boom, it all comes back concordance, you know, all of these guys were isolated from the same day, the same place, confirming the possibility of that outbreak. And, you know, it pains me to say this, but, you know, people are still printing out trees and, you know, putting tables of metadata and so forth to do this. This has got to get better. But, um, but anyway, um, just to say again that, you know, we expect, and this goes back to one of the first principles I talked about, which is the fact that you expect 
the genetic similarity and epidemiological similarity. Okay, we're almost there yet. Um, I'm going to talk about this, you know, partly because um, I, there's a lot of enthusiasm about approaches that don't have to do all this crazy stuff uh, like MLST, and that may be more computationally uh, effective and faster and so on. So I'm going to talk about MinHash or MAN. So MinHash, MinHash is this... Uh, uh, is this algorithm that was developed, I think, in the 90s, uh, that is primarily, that was originally uh, developed so that you could compare web pages to one another, and you could efficiently determine whether or not they were extremely similar or identical, or they weren't. Um, you know, it uses, uh, you know, so in the context of text, you know, you would take substrings of the text, um, and then you would, you know, so once you've taken your, your um, uh, once you've taken the, the, uh, the web page, deconstructed it into all the different substrings, um, you could then uh, apply this algorithm uh, where each substring would then go through a hashing function. The hashing function would spit out a number. And in minhash, you basically say, you know, agree that, okay, every, you know, every web page, I'm going to give it, you know, let's say 10, uh, 10 uh, uh, substring to represent itself as a sketch. And I am going to pick the lowest 10 of those, minhash. And so then you can just essentially compare, rather than having to compare word by word, you compare the minhash uh, sketches to one another. And if they match, well, you can, uh, you're, you're going to figure that out. Uh, so people got wise to the fact that, hey, you know what, we're using that for comparing documents. Can't we just use that to compare uh, sequence data? And so MASH is the adaptation of MinHash in the context of molecular data. And, you know, they they souped up things. And, I, and one of the things that they, they were very uh, smart to do was, you know, they, they use a sampling function that enables you to essentially estimate the the mutation rate between two different genomes based on this, you know, uh, ma uh, the, the math sketches. And so basically, and now the other thing that's super cool is the fact that because you're using, now, you know, in in uh, uh, a web page, you're taking uh, substrings here, you're dealing with cameras. You, because you're using cameras, you don't have to worry about it being from an assembly. It could be assemblies, it could be metagenomic data, it could be raw sequencing reads and so on. And I think the thing that blew me away the first time I saw this was that they had used it to cluster all of the RefSeq genomes from all these different species. Like how else, like, you know, the fact that you could perform a, a basically a phylogenetic analysis of a whole bunch of different species uh, that don't, don't share very many genes uh, was kind of wild. Couple of additional considerations. I'm pretty pretty close here. Uh, we know that the MLSD is not. It's a compromise. You know, you want robust performance, but you know that you're going to lose discriminatory power because we're not using all the genes. We're only using core, and because we're you know for every gene we're taking uh, the sequence, collapsing it to a single allele. So we know that the, the discriminatory power is just not enough. So then we know that this has to be supplemented with analysis with higher discriminatory power. So either SNVs or uh, MLSP with more genes, but on a smaller number of genomes. Once you know that you have a family, you dig in with those approaches. Uh, in terms of centralizing databases, uh, one of the things that has been proposed is allele hashing, you know, because a lot of people will have their own database, you know, in their own institution and they're not sharing with the world. So, and then at some point they're like, we should be sharing with the world. Uh, but then at, by that time, everything's baked in, all the allele numbers and the sequence types have been baked in. So how do you deal with that? The best way to do that is to, again, use hashing your friend so that a particular sequence fits out a particular code that is unique to that sequence. 
So that way, if we're you're all using the same hashing function, then we are all talking the same language. Um, nomenclatures. Most people don't know about nomenclatures until SARS, uh, COVID-2, sorry. Um, because of the development of this particular tool that would assign uh, genes to a lineage. Um, you know, so and nomenclatures are essential. You can't do genomic surveillance without a nomenclature system that will systematically issue lineage names or strain names or whatever uh, based on the sequence that you have. Um, because then, you know, that enable that enables communication between groups without necessarily having to sequence, uh, sorry, share the sequence data. Although, as you know, and I will tell you, you have, you should be sharing the sequence. Uh, in terms of uh, bacterial genomes, the only constant so far is that we know that, you know, that basically every species needs, needs its own nomenclature. And there's the idea that, you know, that you should also always be doing some sort of hierarchical uh, uh, nomenclature with several levels of similarity. Okay, the recap moment. Some parting thoughts. Um, this is in phylogeny, just to recap. Not we're not doing phylogenetic analysis. We're doing the best we can in a context where, because of scale and a lot of biology, sometimes phylogenetic analysis isn't even feasible. Um, you know, so WGS based, based subtyping ultimately relies on trying to take from the genomic information enough so that we can develop, uh, you know, good estimates of genetic similarity. Um, but realistically. You know, we're talking about developing genomic surveillance on top of this. If you have a PhD student that is going to be analyzing several hundred genomes and you know, just do the proper thing and do a proper phylogenetic analysis, maybe put it through some of this, you know, type of voodoo so that you can generate data that you can compare to other studies and so forth. But this is not about being phylogenetically correct. Um, MLSP analysis, you know, it sends me that I'm here defending them because I never liked <laughs> them in the first place. But here we are. Uh, it works well for, you know, for scale up because uh, it's fairly robust. Um, and at the end, but, you know, but at the same time, we know that it doesn't have enough resolution for drilling down into. Uh, into some cases, such as, uh, you know, some complicated outbreaks where maybe there's not a lot of genetic variability there. So you, they, gen they generally have to be supplemented with things like SNP analysis or, or uh, you know, higher levels of MLSP. Um, 